two very heavy uh, presentations. So we, we uh, thank you very much, General Marabit, and we, we move on to the next presentation by Dr. John Saiko on new jihadist threats in Sahel and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as we have already, you know, we, we've been shown, you know, uh, the, by the previous presentation, uh, Libya is where Mediterranean meet the Sahara Desert, you know. So, um, so how e we know how easily, you know, uh, you know jihadist um, uh, proliferation uh, I I is uh, continue on, on this uh, batch of, of land. And uh, so, our, um, Dr. John Saiko is a co-founder and director of Brahan Global, and uh, um, so he has been working on um, African affairs, but from the, the you know, uh, diplomatic and uh, information uh, point of view. And so uh, today um, he, uh, we asked him to uh, present about the, the recent jihadist rise, uh, the trend of the recent rise in, in, in uh, jihadist activities in Sahel and Sub-Sahara region. So, um, Dr. Saiko, uh, please uh, turn on your microphone. Uh, yes. Yep, I'm here. Um, let me share my screen. Please. Da, da, da. And yes, share. And let me maximize my presentation here. Everybody sees that. Yes, yes, great. First of all, thank you everybody for joining today and thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a fascinating topic and I think one that's very timely given the situation on the ground uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa and in the Sahel. And also, I, I, one of the things I wanted to turn to is the implications for Japan, um, Japanese government and private interests too, which I think will probably be of, of great interest to the, um, the attendees today. So, I mean, I think the first point to start off with is that Sub-Saharan Africa is in a very bad way right now in terms of specifically around jihadist insurgencies. And so we get two sides of the coin. If you look at places like Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Central African Republic, I don't really consider these you know, jihadist insurgencies per se, even though there are occasionally religious undertones around them. What I'm talking about are you know, ones that specifically um, refer to jihadist groups, ones that have pledged allegiance to IS or Al Qaeda and are operating around you know, that sort of mantra. And today, you know, there's a few things I just wanna go over. One, why are we seeing this rise? And this rise has very specifically come in the last, really the last 10 years, but the um, effectiveness of these groups as warfighters has increased significantly in the last couple of years. Um, common characteristics of these groups, they're not all the same. We're gonna talk about four of them. Uh, you know, the next one's here in the, you know, the Central Sahel, which um, uh, Dr. Morbido has just covered in a little bit of detail. Also the Lake Chad Basin, which is referring to Boko Haram, uh, which many people I'm sure are familiar with. Then also Northern Mozambique and Somalia, um, which you may or may not be familiar with to some extent. And then also the implications and opportunities for, for Japan. So uh, in a two second nutshell, uh, you know, again, I, every topic that I'm covering here could be devoted two hours, I think. So I'm gonna go relatively quickly. One of the, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa since independence, say roughly 1960, you can almost look at three sort of eras of conflict. You know, 1960 to the end of the Cold War, roughly 1990, relatively calm. Um, you did see interstate conflicts, uh, largely Cold War driven, uh, lesser, a, a smaller amount of intrastate conflicts and wars of independence and whatnot, although they were there. From about 1990 to the early mid 2000s, you saw this kind of breakdown, this post-Cold War breakdown um, that you saw in Africa, really around the transition to democracy, the loss of Cold War patrons, and you saw a rise of rebel movements in places like Sierra Leone, Liberia, and I can kind of characterize these as classic rebel movements. These are movements that wanted to capture the capital, take power, and become the governing, governing body. Now, one of the things that you've seen in the last decade or so is this movement away, both by, I think, the jihadist groups and non-jihadist groups toward a, a little bit more of, I say, called the complex insurgencies. And, you know, the jihadists have really taken, I think, advantage of several situations uh, on the ground, which I'll go through. You know, one is, I think, you know, the newfound prominence of these movements, you know, IS and Al-Qaeda, 
they make for you know the post 9/11 uh, you know situation in Africa. I was living in South Africa at the time, uh, you know, 2004, 2006 in Pretoria, and I remember seeing you know people in Osama bin Laden T-shirts. Now it wasn't because they were necessarily pro jihad, but it was a sort of anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist statement to make. So, um, but the bottom line is these movements did come to light, and I think movements and groups that did have these sorts of um, tendencies now had a sort of, uh, you know, a, a patron to grab, grab onto, even if they weren't formally linked. And I'll, I'll come to that. Um, you also did see in the 2000s onward a lot of radical education sponsored by Saudi Arabia, other Gulf states, you had uh, religious leaders traveling to Saudi, uh, in, uh, single out Saudi because it was a source of uh, great attention and receiving education in, you know, Wahhabist and um, other Salafist sort of education that they then brought back to the continent. To go back very quickly, Christians and Muslims have lived side by side for generations in Africa. Um, most of the all, religion in Africa tends to be quite, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Christians, Muslims will all you know, still worship ancestors. They'll bring traditional reliefs into the religious practice of the practices that they have, and in general tend to be quite moderate and accepting. And so this radical education did change the, the situation quite uh, drastically. Now then you had the issue also of poor governance and state weakness. So you had a vacuum of power where these groups and you know, even non-jihadist groups could move into, establish control over territory and take advantage of weak states um, and show an alternative to these states in some situations. One issue is demogra demography. You can't ignore it. Um, Africa still has the highest rate of growth uh, anywhere across the world. Niger, which uh, uh, General Morvito referred to, uh, a birth rate of 6.9 children per woman to this day. And if you look across the Sahel in particular, you're seeing growth rates of five and six um, children in situations where, unlike in years past, where infant mortality was quite high, that's been halved and you know, brought down significantly. Long story short, is any situation where you have a lot of young men with no jobs and no opportunities, you're going to have a problem with um, you know, a very vulnerable population. Um, regional and ethnic grievances, these have gone on for a long time. Oftentimes a very strong state has kind of pushed those down and suppressed them. Um, in a situation where you've got a weak state, a lot of these have been allowed to fester and I think been exacerbated by some of these groups. And then lastly, one issue I'm very familiar with is the ENF security forces. Militaries have had a significant deficit in funding and support since really the end of the Cold War. And I don't think this is raised nearly enough in um, in uh, discussions, but you know, African militaries, especially in the Sahel, are in terrible shape, and they really do not have the capability to fight wars against these insurgent movements. So, I'm going to talk about these four movements uh, that I mentioned before in a minute. Now, they're, you know, these are all unique movements, and I don't think there are discussions around this and in the analytic community of how well they're linked up together. Personally, uh, you know, my background is in the U.S. intelligence community. I tend to discount a lot of the linkages that I often see set out in the press. Um, these tend to be homegrown movements. I don't really think that they're necessarily praying or you know, benefiting from one another or from kind of global IS or AQ um, support in, in many situations. I mean, again, that's up for debate. And frankly, the intelligence picture is very weak. But uh, in terms of characteristics, like I said, these past rebel governments, uh, rebel movements, you know, places like Liberia wanted to capture the capital. Many of these movements will make the claims that they do. However, they show no real signs of trying to do so. Um, and again, this is up for interpretation, but ultimately these groups are more or less happy to sit in the countryside and, um, and really get fat off the land rather than actually trying to take over uh, national governments. They tend to be small in size. None of the movements we're gonna discuss today probably has more than 10,000 fighters in the field at any one time. I mean, that's, that can be a large, in some places, but in general, they're lightly armed. They rely upon stealing arms from militaries in, in contacts. Uh, they tend to be quite nimble though, and they know the, the terrain, they can fit in, they can blend in very well. And so they are quite effective. Uh, criminal activity, um, again, the previous presentation talked about the uh, human trafficking networks through the Sahel up to Italy and the rest of Europe. That is a huge moneymaker for many of these groups, especially in the Sahel. And again, this is one that we can debate, but. Honestly, at the end of the day, why I raise this is because oftentimes you will see African governments claim that these are external movements, that this is not something that's coming from 
uh, you know, Mozambique or Nigeria or somewhere else. In reality, these governments do have to accept, I believe, that these are oftentimes primarily homegrown movements. Uh, they should not be blaming the, you know, somebody from outside for the problems that they're having. Uh, and then you know, the last point, too, is the jihadist nature. When you have, again, a large number of unemployed young men who are getting paid oftentimes $50 a month to join up when they have no other opportunities, um, again, the intelligence picture is weak. But in general, I would be a bit skeptical in thinking that these are true jihadists and every member of these movements are focused on you know, the establishment of a caliphate or the installment uh, the, or installing um, Sharia law, uh, just to uh, throw that out there, because I, I think it's an important thing to know. Just a quick map to show you what I'm going to be talking about today. I think ignore Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Egypt for now, um, kind of very different dynamics. You know, the four movements, you know, obviously you can see Mali, Burkina, Niger. This is the, the first one that I'm going to talk about and one that obviously has a lot of currency. Nigeria, which again is the Lake Chad Basin. It's not solely Nigeria. Cameroon, uh, Niger, and uh, Chad are also very much affected. Then you've got Somalia to the Far East. Um, Mozambique is the last one that I'll, or third one that I'll talk about because I think this is a new and quite interesting one that um, actually has some, some uh, implications for Japan. One quick thing, you see the small Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, this just kind of characterizes a lot of the things that you know, I think I'll come to. There's a small, Eastern Congo has several rebel groups that have been operating there for decades with lots of different motivations. Really, frankly, they're criminal movements more than anything else, uh, quasi-ethnic movements. But a few years ago, one of those movements decided to start calling itself uh, Islamic State in Central African province, uh, ISCAP. And this has created this huge, uh, I don't know, uproar in the kind of analytic community because ISCAP then started taking claim for the attacks in Mozambique a couple of years back. And so it's created a huge debate over whether this is actually an Islamic State sort of uh, proxy war going on in Mozambique, driven by people in the Congo. Honestly, personally, I think it's you know, absolutely not true at all. Uh, I don't think there's any historical links between the two. There's no proven links between foreign fighters coming from DRC down to Mozambique. There are reports of a handful here and there. But again, it gets back to this issue of responsibility. Um, governments do need to take you know, acceptance or need to start accepting that these are homegrown movements rather than blaming others. Uh, and then again, last night, just that chart in the lower left corner, you can see the trends in terms of casualties related to these movements. Don't trust any figures around casualties, fatalities, um, displacement. I think all of them tend to be off um, and underreported by a significant degree. So, uh, but you can see the trend line and I think that's the important point. So just to jump in, uh, can I, I wanna move through these relatively quickly. Uh, you know, this map shows where the attacks are. You know, the Sahel has taken off in a, a terrible way in the last couple of years. The thing to note here are those arrows. The arrows moving towards Senegal, Côte d'Ivoire, Ghana, Togo, Benin, um, and then Northwest Nigeria too, which has not been affected in the past like the Northeast has. Uh, the trend lines here are extremely worrying. Now, how did this start? I won't go through all the history, but the bottom line is once the fall of Libya in 2011 actually really set this off. Tuareg, who were kind of the desert people of the Sahel, moved back into Niger and Mali, uh, and also in early 2010 set up a, you know, a sovereign state in Azawad in northern Mali, more or less took over the northern half of the entire country within a, a couple of months. With that, a few extremist movements that have been operating in Algeria, uh, GSPC and AQIM, um, outgrowths of those movements started to grow to join up with the, um, uh, the Tuareg. And you know, this, it's a long, complicated story, but bottom line is those movements started to um, claim ascendancy in the north and across Mali over the last few years. Early on, MINUSMA, the um, UN peacekeeping force, did stabilize the region. The French with Operation Barkhane, um, also referred to earlier, um, has been on the ground for several years. However, this early stabilization since about 2016 has gone downhill. Um, just a few things about this. I mean, this is the poorest region of the world. Niger is the last ranked country in the Human Development Index. Uh, Chad, Mali, and Burkina Faso are in the bottom eight. So, you know, you just have to keep that in mind that this is the least capable region of the world in stopping this sort of thing. Um, again, almost completely Muslim, but again, a tolerant, historically quite a tolerant place. And you know, the, since 2013, these actors have intervened, at, I mean, multi-billion dollar cost. Barkhan is almost a billion dollars a year. Um, Minusma is more than a billion dollars a year. 
and I throw this out too from UN peacekeeping, Japan is the number three contributor to UN peacekeeping in the world. So even if there's not a direct implication all the time, there's a significant indirect implication for Japan around um, anything related to peacekeeping. And you know these insurgents, these are not strong movements, but they have been able to take out you know, on at least three occasions, almost a hundred or more than a hundred military, Chad, Mali, and Nigerian, uh, which is a huge number when your military is only number about you know maybe 20 to 30,000 um, soldiers in the field. And what you've seen in the last year though, is you know, again, a significant increase. These are, this is from ACLA data, um, uh, it's a database that kind of tracks uh, attacks around the world. And you have seen this increase in fatalities and number of clashes. Why that is increased in the last year is hard to say. You know, some people would look at COVID as part of the, part of the issue. Um, however, I think it's also just these groups being very clever about how they manipulate communities. They've turned sides, you know, communities that don't like each other uh, in, in this region. Oftentimes it's pastoral farmers versus pastoralists, you know, the cattle that tread over the farmland. These are conflicts that have gone on for years. And then small subgroups of ethnicities that have had tensions dating back for generations. And these groups have been very clever at um, exacerbating these uh, conflicts between groups. So ultimately, we're at a bit of an impasse here. You know, there's discussions of negotiation with some of these groups. France has consistently said that they're you know, not going to negotiate with terrorists. Uh, however, there's increasing, increasing um, dissatisfaction with France across the region. And so at least a lot of questions what the, Fran uh, the French role is going forward. So again, I could spend a lot more time on this, but just for interest of time, I need to move forward. Now, the other regional conflict, and again, you can see it's not that far from where we were talking about is in Northeast Nigeria around Boko Haram and um, its outgrowth, the Islamic State West Africa province. This has been in effect since 2009. Also similar to before, it's ebbed and flowed, very similar religious and socioeconomic dynamics uh, in terms of the tensions between communities. Uh, but you know, the, I, the hard core of Boko Haram has been quite radical in terms of you know, the no education for women. Boko Haram, uh, you know, Western education is forbidden, which is what this means. The group uses another name now, but generally most attacks up here are, are understood by this group. You did see, um, again, by 2014, 2015, the group peaked. It did have a great deal of success, but uh, a slightly more effective security service response, including mercenaries, which is an interesting dynamic, did erode the group. However, in the last couple of years, similar to the Central Sahel, you've seen this uptick in violence. And, um, and also, again, like I said, Northwest Nigeria too, which is a separate situation. But the um, you know, ISWAP in particular, one thing that they're quite good at around the Lake Chad Basin is in, on the Chadian side is actually protecting civilians. Civilians look at the Nigerian and the Chadian military oftentimes as a uh, predatory force. They steal from them. They, you know, will, you know, violence against civilians is quite common by militaries. And so they look to insurgents to actually protect them and they will pay them taxes. They will uh, pay them to protect the trade routes because the state is not doing that. And so this gets back to that issue around the weak state creating a situation whereby these groups can prosper. So um, yeah, and another quite worrying one. Mozambique is the newest insurgency and probably the most mysterious. Nobody knows who is carrying out these attacks. There is a group called um, ASWJ, al Suno wal Jama, uh, that most people believe is behind them, um, a, a radicalized group that kind of came up in the early 2010s, were um, pushing for you know, kind of a more radical form of Islam in the north. Cabo Delgado, northern Mozambique, is only about 50-50 split, maybe slightly more Islamic than Christian. So this is actually the you know, insurgency that is taking place in the most um, diverse community or diverse region across the continent in terms of uh, religion. But um, you know, this is an area with persistent poverty, traditionally underdeveloped by the state. Uh, but then looking offshore, and this is what I'll come to at the end, these gas fields offshore are going to quadruple Mozambique's GDP. And I was just in Mozambique in November, December, and one of the big narratives is that people in the community, um, they think they're gonna be left behind. They're being left behind already. You know, the jobs that are being created in Mozambique, the Praia, Pemba, to you know, develop these gas fields are going to people from Maputo all the way down south. They're almost basically a different country, even though it's the same, same capital. Um, and they resent it. They don't see the opportunities going to them. And this is one of the drivers that many people believe is behind the rise of these movements. 
So again, coming back to, it's not necessarily a jihadist movement, but um, you know, there's a lot of different factors that come into it. Now, lastly, Somalia. Somalia is slightly different than I think some of the other ones. It's definitely the most entrenched and longstanding movement. Um, this group Al Shabaab, you know, comes up really from the early 2000s. Somalia d just d has been decimated as a state since really the early 90s. It has not existed as a as a unitary state since that time. And so, in a similar vein, you know, the communities have looked to Al Shabaab and some of its other groups to as protection in many ways. Um, but definitely the most powerful movement, you can see the armaments here are definitely more impressive than you see for some of the other movements across the continent. The co international community has been involved in Somalia in a big way for two decades and with almost no impact, unfortunately. And, um, you know, for a while there was a, a bit of progress, but you know, I'll just come to the map on the next one. You can see, I mean, this is a map showing who controls what. Anything in white, so you see the capital and a few little splotches of white in the south, that's government controlled. And yet, and look how small that is. You know, the government cannot control anything in the rural areas. It will take a town, but it will lose it almost immediately. Um, Shabab, is, some studies recently showed that Shabab is probably earning more from taxation, including inside Mogadishu, than the Somali government. And so um, I think this is, of all the conflicts on the continent, probably the most intractable and um, one that is, you know, very, very difficult to see resolution in the near future. Now, quickly, I just want to talk about Japan's Africa interest because I think this comes into, uh, you know, really, I want to make this relevant for all of you. Now, if you look at, you know, the Free and Open Indo-Pacific Initiative, obviously, Southern and East Africa are a big part of this. You've seen growth in Japanese firms and banks investing in the region. Ports and infrastructure is a, uh, you know, a huge focus. Uh, aid, about 1.5 billion, and it's been consistent even with cuts in international aid in recent years. A very big focus on skills development, which in, in my opinion is, is laudable. The continent trade is about 20, 20 billion in total. That's actually just behind UAE of all places. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk, I think a bit of disappointment in official circles where you know, I think there's a push to get a lot more African trade, this $30 billion push. Um, and then, you know, former PM Abe even said in 2019 that acknowledged that it that didn't come anywhere near that. And so um, Japanese investment in the continent still is a bit lagging and also very heavily focused on places like South Africa that tend to be quite well developed. Um, East Africa is growing, Kenya to an extent. Um, TCAD tends to be the primary political tool for engagement. But, um, but ultimately, the bottom line is here is Japan is a I pray a secondary player. I mean, if you look at China, uh, I mean, I think China is actually such a player, you know, far beyond even the U.S. I mean, if you look at U.S. interests in Africa, they've been dwarfed by those in China. Um, I think Japan is, you know, a, a bit below kind of the U.S. and EU. But if you look at the UAE, Turkey, um, Qatar to a lesser extent, those are that's kind of the kind of the area where I kind of see Japan on the continent. Uh, and security also has not historically been a major focus, but Japan does have a base in Djibouti that has done quite a bit on piracy. Now, where does, the big question, what does Japan care about these jihadist movements? And frankly, if you look at the Sahel, Somalia, there's not much there. There really isn't. I, they'll circulate a paper that kind of lays out where Japanese companies are. I don't think there's any Japanese investment in Somalia whatsoever, very minimal in the Sahel. Uh, in Nigeria, you know, Japan was importing three and a half billion dollars in oil as of 2014 from Nigeria. That's down to about 180 million. So, you know, Japanese oil interests have, have kind of been negated a little bit in Nigeria. And even there, Boko Haram doesn't threaten oil. Um, however, Mozambique is quite interesting. So, Ravuma One, which is the gas concession, is, you know, Mitsui is a 20% shareholder. Total is the operator. Um, and then, you know, recently, you know, Japanese government announced a 14.4 billion financing deal. To develop this project. So this is a massive, um, I mean, really by Japanese standards, a massive investment on the continent. And now where is that going to come from is that Tokyo Gas is going to be the off taker. So about 25% of all the gas that comes out of Mozambique for the next 20 years is going to be going directly to Japan. So again, you see a key national interest there. Um, however, the development of these gas fields, Total has suspended its operations. It's evacuated 3,000 personnel from the Afungi Peninsula uh, to suspend operation. Total is in a situation where it's trying to figure out what it wants to do and how it wants to go forward because it has these offtake agreements signed. It needs this project off the ground in 2024, but right now they can't do any work because of this insurgent threat. 
And so, you know, one of the things my company does, we actually do military training there, and we're seeing that sort of um, uh, the need. You know, the military has shown itself absolutely unable to respond in the field. And so, um, one of the things I would throw out is that in the near to medium term, this security assistance is something that Japan uh, probably should consider and give some thought to, because this is an area that the Mozambicans uh, need a great deal of assistance and will allow this project to go forward. So, you know, this is my conclusion. I think this is uh, one of the areas where Japan can make a huge impact around capacity building. This is not an area where, you know, France and the US are doing quite a bit in the area of inter intervention, not really in Mozambique. Actually, nobody's really doing much of anything in Mozambique. China has a good, has, has good relations with the Mozambicans, but they tend to shy away from security. They just don't really want to get involved there. Um, so, you know, this is where it's kind of asymmetric warfare in a sense. If Japan wants to think about opportunities and ways that it can get, you know, curry favor with African governments and have a real significant impact, I do think that the capacity building element um, is one that um, can, be, can be quite useful. So um, let me stop there. I have tried to stick to about 20 minutes and a bit over, but uh, a lot of ground to cover. Thank you very much, Dr. John Saiko, for your very comprehensive presentation of, of, of the situation and also your assessment are very helpful uh, for, for Japanese uh, who has stakes in this region. Uh, we have some you know, energy expert in Japan or um, African specialists in